Wrexham, the unofficial capital of North Wales and the largest town in the Principality north of the Brecon Beacons has had a chequered history. It has served as an ecclesiastical centre, an agricultural market town, a centre for heavy industry, a military headquarters and today a centre for commerce and light industry. Its origins, like those of so many towns of ancient foundation, are concealed by the fog of history. Even the origin of its name is a subject that's regularly debated. So where can we start to tell its story in one comparatively brief visual presentation? The late A. H. Dodd, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Wales, opened the first chapter of his History of Wrexham with from rooftop level in Wrexham, one's westward gaze roams over huddled villages and old colliery workings to the unobtrusive curve of purple moor above Minera. Eastward, the foreground falls softly in wooded and pastured folds to the silent twisting Dee, beyond which nothing breaks the monotony till the sandstone hills of Bickerton and Peckforton rise like sleeping giants above the plain. Between the two lies Wrexham, a true border town. Every town is the subject of constant change, and Wrexham is no exception. Almost daily, the aspect of many an old street is changed as another builder embarks upon a new development, and yet the essential character of the old town remains. The early history of the Wrexham area is to all intents and purposes unrecorded, and even much of the Middle Ages is a closed book. It's not until the closing years of the 15th century that surviving evidence of Wrexham's past becomes clearly visible. This map shows Wrexham in the late 19th century, with the shaded area representing the town some 300 years previously. By the late Middle Ages, the core of the town of Wrexham existed on its present site, a market town built up around the central hub of the church. Details of the original church are few and far between, but we do know that it was dedicated to the Celtic Saint Silin. According to the noted Wrexham historian, Alfred Neobard Palmer, legend had it that the first site selected for a church was that known as Brynna Fynon, close to the present-day Regent Street. But divine intervention led to a change of heart, so that the church was actually built on Brynna Grog, the Hill of the Cross, as the site was then called. The first two buildings to stand on this site have long since gone, for in the latter part of the 15th century, when the Tudors were poised to seize power in London, work commenced on the present church dedicated to St Giles. The new building was certainly on a much grander scale than its predecessors, but its construction was not without its problems. Today, the parish church of St Giles is regarded as one of the finest pieces of our architectural heritage. It's a magnificent building, which has dominated the skyline for over 400 years and clearly reflects the importance of the church in the life of 16th century Wrexham. Looking down the nave towards the high altar, we must remember that this would have been one of the last churches to have been built for the Roman Catholic faith for some 300 years, we can see the loving care with which the craftsmen of the time decorated this building to the glory of God. It's in the parish church that we can see the surviving evidence of the social life of the earlier inhabitants of the town. Indeed, the earliest image of what a Wrexham citizen may have looked like is to be found here. 
At the top of the tower, the stonemasons of various times have carved contemporary faces to decorate the church whenever new building work has been carried out. If this face from the 19th century restoration is a true likeness of its time, then this is a face from the 18th century. And these must represent the earliest period of the present church, the faces of the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Inside the church, we see clearly the changing fashions of the past, as reflected in the decorations on the walls. This late medieval wall painting shows the rather naive style of art associated with the pre-Renaissance period when the church was first built. This shows the Day of Judgment, when all the dead shall rise again. This 17th century memorial to Miss Mary Middleton of Croyce Newith Hall depicts a similar scene to that shown in the wall painting. Here, the rejuvenated Miss Middleton is seen rising from her tomb at the call of the heavenly trumpets. In this memorial, the great sculptor Rubiliac has recreated a fantasy, but with the skill and realism of the Age of Enlightenment. Outside, in a prominent location at the foot of the tower, lie the mortal remains of Elihu Yale, the American-born son of a Wrexham family. He made a fortune in the East Indies by rather questionable means, before earning his place in history by a generous benefaction to a newly founded college in New England, which, in gratitude, took his name. Even humour has its place, as seen in the small memorial to the parish clerk. Here lies interred beneath these stones the beard, the flesh, and all the bones of Wrexham Clark, old Daniel Jones. Also proudly displayed inside the church are the colours of the local regiment, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, who have long been associated with the town. The regiment's battle honours and memorials record a history of service in every corner of the globe, a service that continues through to the present day, as recorded by the church's latest treasure, the Tercentenary Royal Welsh Fusiliers Memorial Window installed in 1989. Other than the church, there's little evidence of 16th and 17th century Wrexham, unless one cares to look beyond the facade of the town as it is today. Now and again, demolition or renovation exposes a glimpse of the past that may have been unseen for generations. Here in Abbott Street, the uninspiring frontages of modern commercial premises conceal a wonderful example of timber framing, which dates back to the 17th century or even earlier. Until the 19th century, Wrexham was a town built of timber, with many properties roofed with thatch. Today, these external appearances have all changed, and with only one exception, the thatched roofs have all gone. On Town Hill, once the very heart of Wrexham, modern businesses have actively made a feature of the buildings in which they are housed. Cut, Shape and Face, a hairdressing and beautician's business, carried out extensive renovations to their premises, and in doing so, exposed and retained a wonderful 16th century building. Here, the old floor level can be seen above the modern-day radiator, with the original wall covered by a fine example of linen fold panelling, where the wood has been carved to give the appearance of folded cloth. Above, in the ceiling, the wattle and daub construction so typical of the period has been used between the joists. Behind the fireplace of an upstairs room, again lined with wattle and daub, is a cavity which may have served as a priest hole. If so, the period is right, for the building dates from the time of the English Reformation, when Roman Catholics were certainly in fear for their lives. Indeed, in 1584, a Catholic teacher, Richard Gwynne, was hanged, drawn and quartered on the Wrexham Beast Market. He was canonised in 1970. Artists have also left as evidence of other fine early buildings that once stood in Wrexham. J. M. W. Turner, the great English landscape painter, visited Wrexham and painted this view of a building in High Street. Had it survived, such an ornate timbered building would be a major feature of the town today. But sadly, it was demolished in the 1850s. 
This illustration of Bridge Street with Town Hill on the left by an anonymous artist clearly shows the type of buildings that were once commonplace in the town. Of particular interest here is the River Gwenvro, flowing along what is now Brook Street and under the bridge to pass below the parish church. Wrexham had a number of notable houses on its outskirts. Some, like Erthig Hall, the home of the York family, and Croes Nowith Hall, the home of Mary Middleton, have survived and serve a valuable purpose in today's society. Others, such as Acton Hall, have been demolished, and we can only visualise their appearance from paintings and photographs. In the 17th century, Acton was the home of the Jeffreys family, whose most noted son was the infamous George Jeffreys, Lord Chief Justice of England to James II, the youngest ever holder of that high office. Obeying the King's instructions, he used the law to help suppress the rebellion of the Duke of Monmouth with great severity, and earned himself the nickname Bloody Jeffreys. Imprisoned for his own safety in the Tower of London, he died there in 1689. These early illustrations of Acton Hall date from the 19th century, when the estate was the property of the Cunliffe family, who'd made their fortune in the Liverpool slave trade. Sir Foster Cunliffe carried out considerable alterations to the house to produce the pleasant residence seen in this print. Located on the highest spot in what is now Acton Park, the house commanded panoramic views of Wrexham and the surrounding area. By the mid-19th century, the Cunliffes had further altered the house to create the rather hybrid building seen in this photograph. During the First World War, the house was occupied by the army, and by the 1920s was the property of the Wrexham furniture manufacturer and retailer, Mr William Aston, who opened the gardens to the public. Again used by the military during the Second World War, the by now dilapidated building was demolished in the mid-1950s. But to return to the town itself. By 1750, Wrexham had developed into the largest town in Wales. Here, in a prominent position facing the High Street, stood the Town Hall, a fine Queen Anne-style market hall building of the type so often surviving in southern England. The ground floor originally comprised a covered, open-sided space where market stalls could be set up away from the problems of the weather. The council met in a timber-panelled room upstairs, which also served as a court of law. This court, and the jail which was in the cellar, was known in Welsh as a Shambar Thier, which, when translated, gave its name to Black or Back Chamber Street a narrow passageway which ran between the town hall and the site now occupied by Burton's menswear store. The town hall's demolition in 1940 was one of the town's greatest architectural losses, and all that remain are photographs and this one privately shot film of its demolition, along with that of the Hand Inn, which stood behind it.
High Street was always the heart of the town, as this print from the 1830s clearly shows. In the distance stands the town hall, facing along a street that's flanked by numerous imposing buildings, which increased in size and number as the town developed with the expansion of the 19th century. This opposite view of High Street shows us the Winstay Arms Hotel. This was originally named the Eagles Hotel, both names originating from the heraldic arms of the Williams Wynne family of Winstay Hall, Ruabham, and was the popular meeting place of the Tories in Wrexham. The field located behind the hotel, where the Asda store now stands, was therefore named Eagles Meadow. The archway, which is seen here on the right, was once the entrance for coaches, which drove into a small courtyard to allow their passengers to disembark under cover. Perhaps the most significant event in Wrexham's history, certainly as far as the development of the town was concerned, was the arrival of the railway. By 1844, the Shrewsbury and Chester Railway Company had bought up land just outside the town, with the intention of providing a mineral railway from Brumbo. By 1854, the company had been taken over by the Great Western Railway. The first railway station was built on the site of the present-day Wrexham General Station. And in this photograph, the station master, his family and the railway staff all pose on the platform of the newly completed building. Within a very short time, however, this building was demolished to be replaced by a grander edifice, which has survived almost unchanged to this day. Designed by the architect Penson, this building was in the chateau style preferred by the Great Western Railway Company. A second, much inferior station known as the Exchange was built alongside the General. Before the mid-19th century, the town boundary had been roughly the end of Hope Street, with a few buildings further out in King Street, probably the first planned street in the town, and the infirmary housed in the building that is now the Art College. In this photograph showing Regent Street viewed from the railway station, the rural nature of the area is still evident, with sheep grazing in the field on the left. The location of the station brought about the construction of houses along Mould Road and the construction of new, very substantial properties in the area now known as Grosvenor Road. These large, middle-class houses were the homes for the businessmen of the town, located within easy reach of their business premises and the railway station. To try and seize the opportunity created by the railway, a group of local businessmen built a new hotel, the Imperial, whose name reflected the pride of the age in the British Empire. This building stood on the corner of King Street and Regent Street, and later served as the offices of the Wrexham Rural District Council. Rival railway companies planning to open a station nearer the heart of town had delusions of grandeur and proposed building a substantial station which was to be named Wrexham Jubilee Station. Unfortunately, their dreams were larger than their bank balances, and the company was forced to settle for a much more modest affair when they bought a second-hand non-conformist chapel, which they converted and moved to the site. The area between these two railway centres now became the commercial heart of the town. New businesses moving into Wrexham found vacant sites alongside Regent Street and built shops, offices and living accommodation there. Later, when the tramway system was established in the town, the route started on Mould Road, journeyed along Regent Street, Hill Street, Vicarage Hill, Brook Street, Bridge Street, Pennebryn and out of the town towards Johnstown. There were no trams in the old part of the town, as the business was moving elsewhere. All around the original town centre, old traditional industries benefiting from the growth in the town expanded into new premises, bringing better and greater employment. Just beneath the parish church, a number of breweries were established. By the mid-19th century, there were 19 commercial breweries in the town, 
in addition to many smaller organizations operating within private alehouses. Within a few years, however, many of the smaller breweries had disappeared, unable to face the competition from the growing number of larger organizations, which had turned the trade into the town's most important industry. So important were the brewers to Wrexham that it's recorded that when a preacher dared to speak against the trade, he was likely to be run out of town by the authorities. In 1849, the town had an official population of 7,000, who were served by no fewer than 60 pubs, five beer shops, four spirit vaults, and 20 off-licenses. From time immemorial, the ales of Wrexham have been held in high estimation, their superior quality being due to the celebrated wells with which the place abounds. These wells supply the finest water for brewing and domestic purposes. Indeed, Wrexham may now be called the Burton of Wales. Alfred Barnard, The Noted Breweries of Great Britain and Ireland, 1892. These wells were located in the Brynna Fynnon area of the town, around the town well. Still extant, but no longer visible, the town well is now located beneath the railway viaduct off Brook Street and can only be accessed through a small door under one of the arches. Next to this railway viaduct are the characteristic oast houses of the old Island Green Brewery, founded by John Jones in 1856. The Nags Head Public House gave its name to the Nags Head Brewery, which stood beside it, and which is recorded as brewing its own ales in the mid-18th century. After various owners had carried out a variety of expansion programmes, the brewery was bought by Mr. Arthur Soames of Newark, and under the managership of his son, Frederick, the brewery grew rapidly to become the largest in the town, occupying a site on both sides of Tuttle Street. The brewery's last expansion was the construction in 1920 of a five-story brew house next to the parish church. Today, this, and the old chimney displaying the monogram S, is all that remains of the old brewery, although the Nags Head Public House has survived. A group of German and Czech businessmen with interests in Manchester decided in the 1880s to establish a German-style brewery in Britain to produce lager. Aware of Wrexham's reputation as a centre for brewing, they purchased land just west of the town centre and built a Bavarian-style brewery. Before construction work was completed, however, the company ran into financial difficulties, and another German businessman, Robert Gresser, who operated a chemical factory at Kevin Maurer, was invited to join the board. His expertise and capital investment enabled the company to begin the production of both light and dark Pilsner lager. Despite this success, the company failed to sell enough of this strange new beer, and as a result went into liquidation in 1892. Robert Gresser then bought the company and continued trading, with special emphasis upon export to the British Empire, as it was found that lager would travel, whereas traditional beers would not. In 1904, Gresser persuaded the White Star Shipping Company to stock Wrexham lager on board its liners, and soon other shipping lines followed suit. Its own railway sidings meant that the giant barrels and crates of bottled beer could be easily shipped throughout the country, and in particular to the great ports. Another industry which thrived in the town during the late 19th and early 20th centuries was that of leather. For centuries, Wrexham had been known for the manufacture of high-quality leather. But the two companies that emerged to dominate this trade were Meredith's Cambrian Leather Works off Salop Road and the Pentravellin Leather Works. Both of these companies employed large numbers of staff in what was a very hard and often unpleasant industry. Untreated hides were delivered to the yard by horse-drawn cart, or in the case of Meredith's, by train to their own sidings overlooking Kaya Road. During the interwar period, the Pentravellin works commissioned a short film which showed the process of leather production at their works.
The industrial development brought about by the breweries and the leather works resulted in the expansion of the town in the surrounding areas of Pentravelin, Brook Street, Salop Road, the area northeast of the Beast Market, and into High Town. Many of these terraced houses have now been cleared in an urban clearance program that began during the interwar period, when Wrexham Borough Council began to build corporation housing in Mysa Dre, Spring Lodge and Acton. Another important feature of Wrexham's development is that of Garrison Town. In the 1850s, the government instructed each county to build barracks to house the equipment for the local militia forces and to provide a suitable place for them to train. In Wrexham, these barracks were built on the edge of town in what is now Regent Street. The Cardwell Army reforms of 1872 gave each infantry regiment a local identity and an area of the country from which it could draw its recruits. The 23rd Regiment of Foot, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, one of the most distinguished regiments of the line, was given North and Mid Wales as its area with the regimental headquarters and depot located in Wrexham. A new barracks was built on the edge of High Town, and the less than 20 years old militia barracks were handed over for the use of the Wrexham police. This military association has developed a strong bond between Wrexham and the Royal Welsh, as it was to High Town barracks that all new recruits reported in both peacetime and during the two world wars. Here they did their basic training, and it was in the town that they relaxed, although some would question the use of that word in connection with the army at play. Since the last century, military parades have been a part of the street scene in Wrexham, as bands headed by the regimental goat Taffy and the regimental pioneers lead a battalion through the streets to receive civic honours in peacetime or to be cheered as they marched off to or returned from war. Wrexham was granted borough status by Act of Parliament in 1857 after a complicated legal procedure headed by several of the leading businessmen of the town, not least of whom was the solicitor John James, who became the first town clerk. The council met in a number of temporary locations before taking occupancy of the old Wrexham Grammar School building on Chester Street, following that school's closure in 1880. The buildings were sold to the Wrexham Corporation for £2,500 in 1883. Very soon, the former school took on the appearance of a municipal building, and the open space in front of it, facing Chester Street, was ideal for civic functions, such as this declaration of the accession to the throne of King George V in 1910. Alongside the old Guild Hall, a fire station was built, and when Wrexham lost out to Bangor in the race for the site of the University College of North Wales, the town received, by way of compensation, a College of Arts and Sciences. This was housed in the room above the fire station and was the forerunner of the Art College and the North East Wales Institute. Wrexham's first public library was also housed in the Chester Street Municipal Buildings until a new library and museum was built in what's generally known as Queen Square. Most of the funding for this building came from the Scottish-American philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Just on the northern edge of the 19th century town stood Llewyn Isa, the property of the Cunliffe family of Acton Hall. When the Reverend George Cunliffe became the vicar of Wrexham in 1826, he resided at Llewyn Isa, and on his retirement in 1875, he left the house to the parish for the use of his successors. By the early 20th century, the house was being used by the Wrexham Rural District Council as additional office accommodation. Shortly after the Second World War, Wrexham RDC offered the house and grounds for sale, and it looked as if the site would be bought by the Crossville Motor Company as the site for their new bus station. Wrexham Borough Council, in need of larger and more modern premises, offered Crossville a site for the bus station in King Street, and bought Llewyn Isa for their own use. The house itself was demolished, and the modern guild hall was built on the site. This was followed by the building of the library and arts centre, and the grounds were developed as a small park. Today, the guild hall building, with its various extensions, forms the civic centre of Wrexham, 
only a few seconds walk from the commercial and retail areas of the town. In the realm of education, a Wrexham grammar school had been founded at the end of the 16th century and had been the principal seat of learning in the town for over 200 years. By 1880, its reputation had declined to such an extent that it was declared to be of little use to the neighbourhood and is now closed pending the establishment of a new school. The mantle once worn by the grammar school was taken over by Grove Park School towards the end of the 19th century. Originally named the Groves Academy, it came under the control of the new Denbyshire County Council in 1889 and following a period of rapid growth moved into new premises in 1902. The education of the poorer children in the town was for many years in the hands of local benefactors such as Lady Jeffreys, who established this school on the Beast Market. It could accommodate 308 pupils and served the town until the opening of the National School in 1884. Forty years earlier, the British School had been opened in Brook Street for the education of the children of nonconformists, and this was the forerunner of the Victoria Schools. Life in Wrexham has never been a case of all work and no play. From the earliest times, there's evidence of a variety of sporting activities taking place in and around the town. The 19th century records show that bear baiting, a sport that's now recognised as barbaric, was held outside the Eagles Hotel, the Winstay Arms. And in premises at the rear of the Lion Hotel, now the site of the Midland Bank, cockfighting was a popular pastime. And if the posters are an accurate indication, a lucrative one. On the edge of town, horse racing was established in 1807 on a course which lay between the present-day Mould Road, Crispin Lane and Plas Koch Road. One of the prime movers behind the races was Sir Watkin Williams Wynne of Ruabon, the leading figure in local society. These were three-day events, with the main event being the Cavalry Cup, competed for by members of the Denbyshire Yeomanry Cavalry. The races were eventually closed down in 1857, partly as the result of the removal of the patronage of Sir Watkin following the anti-racing campaign led by the vicar of Wrexham, the Reverend George Cunliffe. They were revived for three years in the 1870s and again as pony races from 1890 until shortly before the outbreak of the First World War. By the 1890s, the racecourse was being regularly used for football matches and became the home of Wrexham AFC. As well as club matches, international games were held on the ground and the first final of the Welsh Cup was held in Acton Park in 1878. Like many industrial towns, Wrexham has a tradition of boxing. Perhaps the best known local boxer was the man who went under the glorious name of Johnny Basham the British and European welterweight champion of 1921. Wrexham has also got a long-established theatrical tradition. Plays had been performed in the upper chamber of the town hall, but during the second decade of the 19th century, local architect Thomas Penson built and operated a playhouse on the corner of Smithfield Road and the Beast Market. Always known as Penson's Theatre, it staged a wide variety of entertainment until it became a temperance hall in the 1870s and eventually a depot for Powell's, a local agricultural implement manufacturer. Other halls for public entertainment were opened in the town centre, such as St James's Hall, built on the corner of Duke Street and Lord Street. 
This building was demolished to make way for the town post office building, now the job centre. The Hippodrome Theatre in Henblast Street was originally used for live entertainment, but very soon became regularly used as a cinema, a role which it still serves today. The theatrical tradition has continued down to the present day, through the activities of the Walter Roberts Pantomime Company, Miss Cathy Dougal's Pantomime Company, and the Wrexham Musical Theatre. Today, the Grove Park Little Theatre is one of the main standard bearers for live theatre in the town. Founded in 1925 by the old boys of Grove Park School, it built its first theatre on land at Caxton Place shortly before the Second World War. A truly amateur and cooperative organisation, its reputation has grown considerably over the years, and today it occupies a permanent home in the premises that were once Hill Street Chapel. The development of moving pictures led to the opening of several cinemas in the town. The Glynn, at the rear of Lampitt Street, was an important social centre from before the First World War until its closure in the 1950s. In the early days, the Glynn commissioned its own local films, such as this record of the 1912 Wrexham Co-op Parade, the oldest known surviving moving image of the town. The Majestic on Regent Street, now a furniture store, began its life as a roller skating rink before becoming the Rink Cinema in 1911. It was the largest cinema in North Wales with a capacity of 1,800 seats and decorated in the Art Deco style so associated with that period. The Empire in Lampitt Street, which had 582 seats, was located in a building alongside the Seven Stars Public House. The ultimate in cinema entertainment came with the demolition of Mary Ann Square and part of Brook Street in the 1930s and the construction of the Odeon Cinema, which now survives as a bingo hall. We've already seen that Wrexham has had a long association with the armed forces, from the days of the militia and yeomanry to the modern-day territorial army. But during the two world wars of the present century, the town took on an even greater military air as troops arrived from all over the world. In addition, the daily lives of the ordinary townspeople were changed beyond all recognition by the demands of a wartime economy. 
During the First World War, the role of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers Depot at Hightown Barracks was greatly expanded, as men arrived from all over Wales to enlist in the Principality's senior regiment. By the time the war was over, 43 battalions had been raised and over 10,000 men had paid the ultimate price. Local industries were turned over to war work, with the production of munitions being all important. The local engineering works of Powell Brothers expanded their workforce, which was now mainly made up of women, to produce trench mortars, which were sent by rail from their works next to the general station. Even the Wrexham and District Electric Tramway Company had to give up its mail staff to meet the apparently insatiable demands of the Western Front, and their places were taken by women who were employed as drivers and conductors. The Second World War had an even greater effect upon the town. As soon as war was declared in 1939, the government introduced anti-bombing measures, which meant that the whole of Britain was blacked out during the hours of darkness. To counter the dangers of collision and accidents, lampposts and pavements were painted to make them more visible in the dark, and air raid precautions were put into place. The permanent presence of military forces meant that parades were a regular feature of wartime life in Wrexham. Many men, either too old, too young, or too essential to the war effort at home, served with the local defence volunteers, later renamed the Home Guard. They gave up their free time to training and protecting local key positions. Women also volunteered for the armed forces and for various local services, such as these ambulance drivers. On the edge of town at Boris, the government built RAF Wrexham, an airfield which was to form part of the defence of Liverpool. This group of RAF pilots at Boris represents the cosmopolitan nature of the wartime RAF. As in an earlier generation, men came from all over the world to fight for freedom, including these American GIs, who are still fondly remembered in the town. Here, a colour party of the US Marine Corps is escorted along Chester Street en route to the parish church, where they were to lay up their colours as a gesture of friendship between them and the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, whom they served alongside at Peking in 1900. One final area of Wrexham's past must be noted if the picture is to be anywhere near complete. Although not located in the town itself, the coal mines of the adjacent areas have had a profound effect upon the development of the town. Today, they are all gone, and only a few relics remind us of the existence of a once proud industry. At Ross Robin, the Wrexham and Acton Colliery operated from the 1860s until 1924. At Havrod Colliery near Ruabon, coal was extracted from the 1860s until 1968, and at its peak it employed nearly 2,000 workers. Neighbouring Bersham Colliery was sunk in 1867 and operated until in December 1986 it became the last Wrexham mine to close. Gresford became nationally known on Saturday the 22nd of September 1934 when an underground explosion at 2am trapped an entire shift in the Dennis section. The Lord Mayor of London's collecting to help out our children and wives The owners have sent some white lilies To pay for the poor colliers' lives Farewell all our dear wives and children Farewell all our comrades as well Don't send your sons down the dark dreary pit They'll be doomed like the sinners in hell. 
only one deputy and five men managed to make their way out of the pit to safety. An underground fire made rescue impossible, and for over 24 hours teams fought to bring the fire under control, but to no avail. By the evening of Sunday the 23rd of September, it was obvious that none of the missing miners could still be alive. And as the rescue operations had claimed a further three lives, it was decided to seal the mine and allow the fire to burn itself out. A further explosion on the following Tuesday killed a surface worker, bringing the total number killed to 266. The whole area was devastated by the disaster, and almost every family was affected as the widows tried to pick up the strings of their shattered lives, and over 800 children contemplated a future without their fathers. Gresford Colliery was reopened in 1936 and remained in production until 1974. Today, all that remains is the head wheel from the Dennis shaft, which forms a memorial to the men who died. In its long history, Wrexham has undergone many changes, but none so dramatic as those of the last 30 years. Gone are the old heavy industries of coal and steel, the leatherworks, and to a great extent the breweries. In their place have come light industries from all over the world, and with them an influx of new people who will help mould the Wrexham of the 21st century.